All right, on Sunday, December 29, 1912, an interesting article came out on the front page of the New York Times. Whole entire front page, it was entitled, The Museum Walls Proclaim Fraud of the Mormon Prophet, and they mean Joseph Smith. And the subtitle was, Sacred Books Claimed to Have Been Given Divinely to the First Prophet Are Shown to Be Taken from Old Egyptian Originals, Their Translation Being a Work of the Imagination. What a comparison with Metropolitan Museum treasures shows. So this was a pretty interesting article examining the validity of the facsimiles in the Book of Abraham. Here is a little more context. Uh, this is the upper half of the article. It came out on the front page. All right, here is the entire front page. You'll see the Salt Lake City Temple in the left-hand corner up there at the top. It's got the three facsimiles on here, and that's really what they used to test Joseph Smith's ability to translate. They used the facsimiles, because remember this is 1912. The rest of the papyri, which was used to create the Book of Abraham, was not found uh, until 1967. All right, so we're going to go through the article. I've included most of it here in the video. So let's start out. The sacred books of the Mormon church, which this holy American cult proclaims to have been given divinely to the first Mormon prophet. So that's interesting. They use the word cult. Uh, these books, which were given to the first Mormon prophet as a solemn addenda to the known scriptures, so an addendum to the Bible, have now been in circulation in Mormon Dome for about 70 years. On their faith that the texts were really produced, through the gift and power of God, hundreds of thousands of devotees have hailed Joseph Smith as the prophet, seer, and revelator of God, and God's spokesman on the earth. His successor, Joseph F. Smith, who was the sixth prophet and president, they hail by the same title, and so strong in their faith that the prophet wields unlimited power in politics, in finance, and in religion in at least two western states. So they're probably talking about Utah and one other state, maybe uh, Idaho or Arizona. Within three months, the only one of these sacred writings in which the test of scholarship could be applied has been submitted to such a test, and its authenticity has been destroyed completely. The walls of the Egyptian rooms of the Metropolitan Museum proclaim it to be a fraud. It's pretty strong words. Dr. Albert M. Lithgow, curator of the Egyptian department, voices unequivocally the condemnatory evidence of the mute Egyptian drawings and hieroglyphics. Two eminent scholars in England, two scholars in Germany, and four of the most noted Egyptologists in the country join without a dissenting paragraph in the condemnation. And uh, towards the end of the video, we go through who these scholars and Egyptologists are and their statements. Up above, we have a picture of Albert M. Lithgow, who is the curator here at the Metropolitan Museum. And this, I guess, is his obituary. Egyptologist dies in a, kind of a blurry picture. The sacred Mormon text, which in this case was the facsimiles, not the entire book of Abraham, but the sacred Mormon text was susceptible of accurate and complete analysis from the simple fact that it was taken from a genuine Egyptian original, so they could test it. The translation was a work of the Mormon prophet's curious imagination. Within a few weeks, all leading officials of the Mormon church will receive from the right Reverend F.S. Spalding, Episcopal Bishop of Utah, the results of an extended inquiry among the scholars of the world as to the accuracy of the, of the Prophet Joseph Smith's work on ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. And this work came out under the name of Joseph Smith Jr. as a translator, which uh, this is a reprint of an inquiry conducted by the right Reverend F.S. Spalding, D.D., late Bishop of Utah, with the kind assistance of capable scholars. So that came out, uh, I think, in the same year, 1912, and you can read in more detail uh, the analysis of Spalding and, the, and more particularly all of these scholars. So Bishop Spalding has collected the opinions of the scholars for distribution among the Mormons themselves. He writes to the Mormons in a kindly mood and describes the ideas of their prophet and founder as self-delusions instead of using a shorter and an uglier word, which I guess is fraud or, or something else. Much of Bishop Spalding's work was done in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in this city, New York City. So that's a, this is a picture of the front of it. 
The ten rooms of the Egyptian collection yielded proof in such abundance that any layman, even, even in Egyptology, can take the drawings as published in the sacred Mormon record, which those are the three facsimiles, and reproduced on this page of the Times and find dozens of duplicates. So there was a lot of uh, very similar papyri that they could compare them to to find dozens of duplicates of certain figures in them on the walls of the museum and in its cases of Egyptian objects. Okay, a certain picture in the Mormon work representing Abraham sitting on the throne of Pharaoh by the politeness of the king. So you'll see that big red arrow. That's pointing to what they're referring to. They, the Mormon prophet said this is Abraham sitting on the throne of Pharaoh. They said they really represent a scene depicted in the museum's hieroglyphics a score or more of times. So they had plenty to compare it to, to see if it was Abraham. Father Abraham, therefore, must have been one of the best-known Egyptian characters. So under the arrow I have, is this Abraham or Osiris? If a bit of Egyptian writing, again, represents what the Mormon prophet says it does, then practically every mummy that has been dug out of Egypt had a bit of the writings of Abraham tucked away beneath its head, and the mummy buried with the religious service calling for the worship of many gods was thus put to rest with a reverential prayer made to the one God whom Abraham recognized. So they're basically saying Abraham was a monotheist, believed in one God, but the Egyptians were polytheists and believed in many gods. The third sacred book, The Pearl of Great Price, differs from the others in that it at least has a source that is traceable and is taken from documents that are capable of translation by scholars in the field of Egyptology. And none of the other books of scripture can we do that. There was no original source. But with The Pearl of Great Price and in particular the Book of Abraham and the facsimiles in the Book of Abraham, we have the source material that Egyptologists compare to see if the translation is right. This is a title page, I believe, of the first edition of the Pearl of Great Price here pictured. Uh, being a choice selection from the Revelations, translations, and narrations of Joseph Smith. So they use that word translation in the first edition. They're trying to get away from that word now in the Mormon church and using the word inspiration now. The reason why it took 70 years for this test to be applied to this important Mormon writing, which has attracted hundreds of thousands of devout believers to the Mormon cult, is explained by Bishop Spaulding in a simple manner. When the Mormon prophet published his translation and proclaimed it divine, there was no one to challenge him because there was no Egyptian scholarship amounting to anything at the time. The working out of the Egyptian alphabet was a matter of more recent accomplishment, and the scholarship that has grown up in its wake has not had an opportunity to overhaul and submerge the Mormon claim to the divine origin of its sacred work. So what made it possible to decipher Egyptian was the Rosetta Stone, which is pictured up here. <clears throat> had three different languages on it, I believe, one being Egyptian, and that was when they were able to figure out uh, the language of Egyptian. The Book of Abraham they especially delighted in because it gave to the Mormons without the corrupting influence of any Christian translation, they're talking about the Bible, a new history of the world's formation direct from Abraham himself through the medium of an Egyptian mummy. So here we see uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac, or about to, with the, uh, the knife drawn, but the angel comes and stops him. The Egyptian mummy and the papyrus inside of it were genuine enough, as is well attested through the scores of duplications of it, which the Metropolitan and other museums contain. As Bishop Spaulding concludes, and as Dr. Albert M. Lithgow, head of the Department of Egyptian Art of the Metropolitan Museum, pointed out to the Times reporter, there is nothing so certain as that the Mormon prophet got hold of pictures showing the common mortuary ritual. Mortuary ritual. These are just funerary documents of the Egyptians, and that, these, and that these pictures recur time and time again throughout the whole period of Egyptian burial. So again, we have plenty of other papyrus to compare it to. Okay, when the Mormon prophet obtained his mummy, and I think they had obtained four mummies, 
and the papyrus that went with it. So he got the mummies and the papyrus that went with it. His followers were in a frenzy of delight over his powers as a divine translator. So here's another opportunity to be tested. The mummy, in fact, and there was four different mummies, was brought to him because of his reputation as a translator, gained through the use as a boy of his seer stone, which is pictured above. He used to use the seer stone in place of the water witch to locate wells and, I will add, buried treasure. That was uh, Joseph Smith's little con he was doing. And he used it through the production of his Book of Mormon in his supposed translation of the Book of Mormon. So this is a picture of his seer stone in about 1826. Good looking stone. As his followers already had a good deal of new scripture in his own special revelations, and from the writing on the gold plates, which came forth the Book of Mormon, supposedly, uh, that he had given back to the angels, he had given back the gold plates to the angel Moroni, it occurred to the prophet to oblige them with still some more scripture. Now, Joseph produced, just produced a ton of scripture uh, that was produced from an Egyptian mummy. When Bishop Spalding was obtaining data, as in the real significance of the papyrus obtained by the Mormons, Dr. Lithgow was absent from the Metropolitan Museum on an Egyptian expedition. He was found at the museum last week and a copy of the Mormon work, which was the facsimiles, with drawings from the original of the Mormon papyrus was shown him. This is, uh, above here is a picture of some papyrus later found in uh, 1967. Okay, so here is what Dr. Lithgow said. It is sad copies of a very familiar papyrus, he said, and a sadder, a much sadder translation. So basically it was a bogus translation. Come upstairs with me and I will show you several pictures that duplicate the figure that the Mormon prophet says is Abraham sitting on the throne of Pharaoh. It is merely Osiris, god of the underworld. So remember from the previous slide, the arrow pointing there to Osiris, uh, Joseph Smith said that was Abraham sitting on his throne. It's not, it's Osiris, it's an Egyptian god. Okay, so that is Osiris, god of the underworld, and I will show you more duplicates of the figure the Mormons declare to be Pharaoh. It is actually Isis, the wife of Osiris, who is always with him. So you can see that big arrow pointing to the other figure here. Uh, that's not Pharaoh, it is Isis. So even back in 1912, this was very easy to figure out who these figures were. And these, that is accurate. It is Osiris and it is Isis. And when it comes to the Mormon picture of God on his throne, signifying the grand key words of the holy priesthood as revealed to Adam in the Garden of Eden, why, that is a sad joke. All right, so Dr. Lithgow goes on. He says, the representation is the most common of all in Egyptian papyri. It is the view of the sun god in his boat. And I further define that as Ray, but he is correct. It is the sun god and more specifically Ray. The Mormon version is right in that this is a picture of a god, but it is the chief god of a polytheistic people instead of God who was worshiped by monotheistic Abraham. And pictures of him were among the widely distributed pictures in Egypt. All right, so the Egyptians were polytheistic. They had many gods. The sun god Ray was one of them. You can see the two pictures up here above. Uh, the one on the left, the big yellow boat with the sun god on top. And then compare that to the facsimile in the book of Abraham. Again, sun god Ray in his boat, the big arrow pointing down uh, to him. It is not God, or Heavenly Father, or Elohim uh, sitting on his throne. It is... <clears throat> one of the Egyptian gods, the sun god Ray, in his boat. Okay, the things that puzzled the inspired Mormon translator were no puzzle at all to Dr. Lithgow. He's referring to some of the figures in the facsimiles that uh, Joseph Smith did not translate, that he said he didn't know or he would uh, translate them at a later time. Okay, so they were simply snatches of a hymn to the sun god inserted on every flat disc that was put for its magical effect as a charm under the head of the ordinary mummy. So here's an example of that. It's called a hypocephalus. This one is pretty similar to the one uh, found in the Book of Abraham in the facsimile. Okay, so they put it under the head of the ordinary mummy. Again, this is just common funerary documents, funerary uh, hieroglyphics. 
The uh, pictures were very badly drawn in the Mormon version, but still were near enough to the originals for their character to be known. A picture that Prophet Joseph Smith declared to stand for, quote, the earth in its four quarters, unquote, was found to stand, in fact, for the four genii of the Egyptians, the four sons of Horus, whose pictures occur time and time again, one with the head of a hawk, one with the head of a baboon, one with the head of a jackal, and one with the head of a human. So you can compare the picture to the left, uh, to the picture of the right. The one on the right is from the uh, Mormon facsimile. These are not the earth in its four quarters. These are very well known as the four sons of Horus with the different heads. Okay, the familiar, the familiar hawk of Horus of the Egyptian hieroglyphics, which was used always to symbolize the soul, became to the Mormon prophet, in one instance, a dove. So it's a hawk, not a dove. Engaged in presenting the Holy Ghost as assigned to Abraham by God's order. And in another instance, it became an angel of the Lord. So again, it wasn't an angel, it's a hawk of Horus. Uh, hovering near Abraham as he lay fastened upon an altar. The first of the three pictures from the Mormon work submitted by the Times reporter to Dr. Lithgow was that of Abraham about to be sacrificed on an altar with a figure bending over him, knife in hand. Okay, so you can see my big red arrow pointing to the guy laying down on the altar. Joseph Smith said that is Abraham, and he's about to be sacrificed. Okay, it's, it's Abraham, not Isaac. All right, beside the altar in the Mormon version stood four figures which the prophet Smith styled the four idolatrous gods of Elkanah, Mamakra, Korash, and Pharaoh. Okay, so you can see that red box I put around them. Are they the four idolatrous gods? Question mark. Okay, near these was a figure which Prophet Smith declared to represent Abraham in Egypt. Dr. Lithgow led the way from his office to the main Egyptian department. First, he took up the portraits of the four idolatrous gods. It was clear that although poorly drawn, one had a hawk's head, one a jackal's head, one a baboon's head, and one a human head. You can see that in this illustration here I have in the slide. And the lower part of all were jars. Those were jars to, to keep the organs of the deceased. Here is a fine representation of the same, said Dr. Lithgow, leading the way to a highly colored wooden box covered with gaudy Egyptian drawings. So you can see they were not four idolatrous gods. They were the names that are on these pictures uh, on this slide. All right, so Dr. Lithgow continues the story. He says, this box we obtained from a niche in the side of a tomb some four years ago. In the box, we found four stone jars. And the picture on this slide above is, is an example of that. And it's what we were talking about on the previous slides. Here they are, and Dr. Lithgow pointed to the jars standing beside their original containers. They were clearly the originals that the Egyptian artist had pictured upon the Mormon papyrus, or the facsimile. The lids contained the pictures of the four genii for handles. You see, explained Dr. Lithgow, they couldn't retain the soft parts of the body when they prepared it for mummification, and so they placed the organs in these jars. That's what they were for. The jars were part of every well-ordered burial. Burial. We have quite a number of sets of them here. Dr. Lithgow led the way to other sets, varying in size, but only in design when they represented radically different periods of Egyptian development. There were three stages of this development. In the earliest, when Egyptian art consisted of things made from Nile mud, the jars had ordinary flat lids. Afterwards, they contained the head of a single human as a stock designed for the lid. And then afterwards, after that, the heads of the four sons of the mythological god Horus. So those are the ones that we see in the uh, Mormon facsimile. Okay, so those appeared on the lids. And here's another example of these jars on, uh, in this uh, picture on this slide. But Dr. Lithgow pointed out that every feature of the Mormon drawings indicated that they belonged to the late period of Egyptian life. For one thing, the men in the earliest period wore a short skirt and in the later period a longer skirt. So the picture on this slide is just, just an example of some of the Egyptian clothing that they had on these uh, hieroglyphs. Okay, and, and were so represented in all the art of each period, respectively. In the Mormon pictures, the skirts were long, corresponding to the kind of characters 
shown upon the covers of the funeral jars, so the late period, uh, or the idolatrous gods to whom Isaac, and then they mean Abraham, not Isaac, uh, was being sacrificed according to Prophet uh, Smith. All right, the figure of Abraham upon the altar of the Mormon version. See the facsimile up there in the right-hand corner of this slide. All right, the figure of Abraham of the Mormon version, Dr. Lithgow explained, was merely the usual scene of the mummy upon its bier. The idolatrous priest, who was Elkanah, <clears throat> who was bending over him to sacrifice him, according to the Mormon version, was, Dr. Lithgow explained, merely the, the familiar figure of the god Anubis, protector of mummies. So the guy with the knife above Abraham, that is the god Anubis. Now, I'll have to note here that if you look at the original facsimile up in the left-hand corner of this picture, there was no head for Anubis. Okay, so Joseph Smith didn't know that this was Anubis and didn't know that it should have a jackal head as is shown on the lower part of this picture. So he drew in a, hemp, he drew in a human head. But if you look at the lower part of this picture, it should be a jackal head because that's how Anubis uh, was portrayed. Okay, so it's not Elkanah, it is Anubis, the protector of mummies. Dr. Lithgow pointed out the figure on a papyrus showing the progress of one Ani of the 18th dynasty toward final judgment by Osiris, god of the underworld. So these people are Osiris, uh, Anubis, and Isis. You know, they're not Abraham. <clears throat> okay, the picture of the god Anubis was shown in every picture where the mummy was shown, and always he was leaning over in a position as if to keep it from harm. To make very clear just how great a hoax the Mormon prophet perpetrated upon his people, it was only necessary to gain a slight knowledge of the use the Egyptians made of their funeral papyri. So just a slight knowledge, just going through the museum, <clears throat> and the Egyptologists figured this out very quickly. Uh, so they know it was a hoax. All right, the king of the underworld, Osiris. In the first place, the Egyptian religion grew up along the banks of the Nile. There they saw the jackals prowling about their burial grounds in the desert and saw the hawks flying over them. They observed the baboons in the forest. When it came to be making up a religion, they made the god of the dead jackal-headed. The soul that flew away from the mummy they pictured as the familiar hawk of the burial grounds. In their papyri, the Egyptian undertakers used stock and stereotype scenes. Look, so just over and over. Osiris, according to their legends, had been the first mortal to die and had been revived partly and so went to become king of the dead. In seeking an explanation of the whereabouts of the dead, they had also to seek an explanation of the whereabouts of the sun during the time it was below the horizon. It grew up in their legends that the sun between sunset and sunrise was lighting the caverns of the dead. And so Osiris, king of the dead, came to be known as the king of the west or the king of the underworld. So this is Osiris, it's Anubis, Isis, it's not Abraham. Okay, each dead person, according to the religious notion, was led before Osiris and his wife Isis and there admitted to the realm of the dead after Osiris had passed judgment upon him. The scenes pictured on the papyrus buried with each mummy were the scenes supposed to occur along his progress after death towards final judgment by Osiris. They were thus stock scenes, so they were very common funerary scenes, and in no way were individual to any particular mummy, except in rare instances where kings died and a record of their deeds was inscribed on papyrus and buried with them. The undertaker reserved a space in his stock papyrus for the name of the particular person with whose body it was laid away. Dr. Lithgow was able to point out such blank spaces with the name in obviously different writing from that comprising the stock scenes and the characters drawn in as border vignettes. The usual papyrus begins with a scene of the dead man on this bier. Then follows a picture of the body being drawn on a sleigh towards its tomb with dancing girls, professional mourners, and priests going before it. A picture shows the interment in the tomb and then begins a series showing the wanderings through the underworld towards the final judgment at the throne of Osiris. And in the Mormon pictures, it was clear that the first one of these stock scenes had been copied off and also the last one. The third piece of writing published with the Mormon's Pearl of Great Price was on a circular disc 
as is pictured above. And this disc Dr. Lithgow went over carefully. Egyptian scholars give this particular disc a name, he said. They call it a hypocephalus, which means literally under the head. So it's, you know, for common funerary occasions. Like the length of a garment on the figures and the kind of lids on the stone jars, this disc shows that the Mormons gained possession of a mummy, it was four mummies, and a papyrus from the comparatively late Egyptian period. So again, the late period. During our work in Egyptian or during our work in Egypt last winter, we obtained some of those discs that were nothing but slabs of Nile mud. Here is a disc of exactly the same sort, Dr. Lithgow remarked, as he turned to a volume on Egyptian religion by Adolf Ehrman. So here's another example of a hypocephalus. This one is not the Mormon facsimile, but has some similar figures. Uh, and this was in the article. It said, plate number one from the Berlin Museum collection, a magic disc for use under the mummy's head. Note similarity to plate number four from the Pearl of Great Price. Okay, Dr. Lithgow took up some of the slight discrepancies in the Mormon pictures from the Egyptian originals. He expressed the wish that he might see the original papyrus that the Prophet Smith translated or a photograph of it instead of the drawings made from it. Okay, so instead of the facsimile, he wanted to see the original, original papyrus. In the first of the Mormon figures, the god Anubis bending over the mummy was shown with a human and strangely un-Egyptian head instead of a jackal's head usual to such a scene. So we talked about this before, and this picture above shows that the original papyrus with no head, then the facsimile where you can see that Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith drew in a human head, and then the bottom one is how it should be. Anubis should be portrayed with a jackal head. Okay, so Joseph Smith didn't know what type of head to draw in. Okay, and, then, and a knife had been drawn into the god's hand. Thus he was made into a shape from which it became possible to glean the idea of the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. And that they mean the attempt, attempted sacrifice of Abraham. Okay, in the third picture again, the leading of the dead man's soul before Osiris and Isis contained an incongruity in one of the figures, that of the black man who uh, Joseph said was a slave. So he, Joseph probably thought that he was a Negro slave and they colored it in black. So Dr. Lithgow explained that the Egyptians in their drawings made the undraped parts of the women in yellow and the undraped portions of the men in dark red. He expressed the belief that the Mormon artist had obtained his black figure by making in black what was dark red in the original and that he had also marred the head, which was meant to be the unshaven head of a priest. And I looked up what other experts say about the black man, and they are saying that it's probably, uh, that this black figure is probably Anubis. So there is a disagreement between them on that. On that. But if you look at, up at the black person in this uh, facsimile, uh, Lithgow is saying he should be dark red, not black. And whether it's a priest or whether it is Anubis, it is certainly not a Negro slave, as Joseph said. Anyway, in many pictures, Dr. Lithgow indicated the manner in which the heads of ordinary people were shown wearing wigs while the heads of priests were shown as shaved. In the museum room in which the latest accessions to the Egyptian collection are kept, an offering table was found in the original stone. It was a gift from J. Pierpont Morgan and corresponded in design to a figure that appears three times in the Mormon drawings or facsimiles. The Mormon prophet translated the object twice as Abraham in Egypt and once as the throne of God. So if you look up at my red arrow here, it's a table. Looks like there's some leaves and stuff around it. So how you get Abraham in Egypt out of that is a mystery. Uh, and, if it's a th and if it's a throne of God, it's a pretty small throne. So I don't know what Joseph, Joseph was talking about. And actually, it is the offering table covered with lotus flowers, which was a part of the regular furniture of a tomb. So it's just common funerary objects and was depicted on practically all papyri as standing beside the coffin or in front of a god to whom offerings were being made. And I looked it up online as well. And uh, some of some other experts have labeled a libation platform bearing wines, oils and flowers. 
but it is certainly not Abraham and it is it is certainly not a throne of God okay I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation on a on a few of these words uh, this book here is the grammar Egyptian Egyptian grammar in English is a grammar reference book by the French Egyptologist Jean Francois Champollion published posthumously in France in 1836 Okay, Bishop Spalding excuses the Mormons for never attempting to have the scholarship of their prophet tested before accepting his translation on the grounds that the Egyptian grammar of Champollion was not completed until 1841. And I saw one date that said 1836 as well. And this picture is another example uh, from that book on this slide. And an adequate knowledge of Egyptian hieroglyphics was not achieved until years later than this. So it was kind of unknown. From the diary of the Mormon prophet himself, a full account is to be had of the gusto with which he received the Egyptian papyrus and proceeded to give it forth in an English version. He received the mummies and two or three rolls of, of papyri from Michael H. Chandler, who promptly gave a certificate of accuracy when he heard the prophet's translations. So he was just trying to sell these things to him, and he was not an expert uh to give him a certificate in Egyptian really wasn't even known at the time. So, okay, so this certificate he signed as proprietor, proprietor of the mummies. Soon after this, the prophet wrote in his diary, I commenced the translation of some of the characters of hieroglyphics and much to our joy found that one of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham. Oh, how lucky. And another of the writings of Joseph of Egypt. Truly, we can say that the Lord is beginning to reveal the abundance of peace and truth. The remainder of the month, the prophet wrote again in 1835, I was continually engaged in translating an alphabet of the book of Abraham and arranging a grammar of the Egyptian language as practiced by the ancients. And this uh, picture on this slide is the uh, grammar of alphabet and the Egyptian language. You can barely make it out at the top. And he would list the characters in the left hand column and then give the uh, explanation of what the character meant uh, over to the right and it's weird because you give one character and then give one two three four like six six lines <laughs> of uh, information about what one character meant so that was odd okay so Jean Francois Champollion wrote one of the best very early Egyptian grammar books and it says the drawings from the Egyptian papyrus printed by the Mormon prophet together with his translation were submitted to Bishop Spalding to leading scholars throughout the civilized world. So leading scholars throughout the civilized world in 1912 took a look at these facsimiles and Joseph's translation. Their comments do not vary in any consequential particular from the comment of Dr. Lithgow of the Metropolitan Museum. Okay, the first one is from A.H. Sace. He says, It is difficult to deal seriously with Joseph Smith's impudent fraud. Uh, wrote Dr. A.H. Sace of Oxford University. The facsimile from the Book of Abraham, number two, is an ordinary hypocephalus, but the hieroglyphics upon it have been copied so ignorantly that hardly one of them is correct. I need scarcely say that Kolob, etc., are unknown to the Egyptian language. Smith has turned the goddess Isis into a king and Osiris into Abraham. Okay, next we have Dr. Flinders Petrie of London University. He was an Egyptologist. He wrote that they are copies of Egyptian subjects of which I have seen dozens of examples. So common funerary documents or papyrus. They are centuries later than Abraham, so they're not in the right time frame. The attempts to guess a meaning for them in the professed explanations are too absurd to be noticed. So Joseph Smith's attempted guesses were all wrong. Okay, the next one is Dr. James H. Breasted of the Haskell Oriental Museum in the University of Chicago. He was an Egyptologist amongst other things. He reviewed the situation at length. He said, if Joseph Smith could read ancient Egyptian writing then his ability had no connection with the decipherment of hieroglyphics by European scholars. So his translations were totally different. 
than European scholars. In publishing these facsimiles as part of a unique revelation to Abraham, Joseph Smith was attributing to Abraham not three unique documents of which no other copies exist, but was attributing to Abraham a series of documents which were the common property of a whole nation of people, the Egyptians, who employed them in every human burial which they prepared, which is odd. <laughs> the little disc for use under the head, the hypocephalus, I believe, did not appear in any Egyptian burials until 1,000 years after the time of Abraham. So again, the facsimile of the hypocephalus was not in the time of Abraham. They were unknown in Abraham's day. Okay, Dr. Arthur Mace, assistant curator of the Metropolitan Museum, who is now in Egypt, summed up the Mormon translations with the following statement. He says, a Figaro of nonsense. And by Figaro, he means a schemer, that Joseph Smith was a schemer and he produced nonsense. Okay, the next one, Dr. John Peters of the University of Pennsylvania, who conducted an expedition to Babylonia in 1888 could find nothing but amusement in the Mormon prophet's work. He could find nothing but amusement. He said the interpretation of the plates, and he's talking about the facsimiles, the interpretation of the facsimiles he wrote displays ignorance. And now we have Professor Samuel A. B. Mercer, Ph.D., who is custodian of the Hibbard Collection of Egyptian Reproductions at the Western Theological Seminary way back in this time period, around 1912. He said, none of these, either human or divine, who helped in Joseph Smith's translation, had any conception of the most commonplace Egyptian characters. So they basically had no knowledge of Egyptian. Now a book came out called Why Egyptologists Reject the Book of Abraham. Based on the scholars that we mentioned here, they came out with a short book, or maybe you could call it a pamphlet, Spalding came out with one, which we already mentioned, called Joseph Smith Jr. as a translator. And then this Samuel Mercer came out with one uh, called Joseph Smith as an interpreter and translator of Egyptian. Both of their pamphlets slash small books were reprinted in this book called Why Egyptologists Reject the Book of Abraham, which is put together by the Tanners. Okay, two noted German scholars, Dr. Edward Meyer of the University of Berlin, which is pictured above, and Dr. von Bissing of the University of Munich, added their opinions to the general chorus of exposure and condemnation. Quote, the papyrus which Joseph Smith declared to be the book of Abraham, wrote Dr. Meyer, and explained in his fantastic way are parts of the well-known book of the dead. End quote. So, uh, book of the dead has nothing to do with Abraham. Okay, Bishop Spalding does not have much hope of reaching the ordinary variety of faithful Mormon who sustains the authorities in all things, including politics. So it was more of a theocracy back then in 1912. Uh, so sustains them in politics and in tithing uh, with his little pamphlet of exposure. But he hopes that the Mormons who have been trained in the universities, you know, like the people at FAIR, yeah, ha ha, and have some conception of the integrity of scholarship, like the people at FAIR, ha ha ha, and the inscrutability of evidence, such as that presented in the Egyptian collection at the Metropolitan Museum, will have open hearts, and so will receive the plain truth presented to them. So the people outside of FAIR who are intelligent uh, probably will. Okay, the breaking up of Mormonism through the desertion of the intelligent part of its membership, which is definitely starting to happen in the last few years, and even before that, is the future for the prophet Joseph Smith's church, which Bishop Spalding foresees. It is for that reason that he prefers to address the Mormons as his friends rather than to attack them. Advanced copies of Bishop Spalding's exposure of the Mormon prophet's translations when they reached the dignitaries of the Mormon church, caused something more than the stir that might normally have been expected. The official newspaper of the church, the Deseret Evening News, which is shown on this page but does not show the editorials, uh, the official newspaper spent its entire editorial page reviling the scholars and scholarship. Brigham H. Roberts, the best known scholar of the church and its chief living defender, publicly thanked Bishop Spalding for the moderation of tone 
characterizing his work and for its scholarly and judicial spirit. Confessing himself to be frankly a layman on all things having to do with Egyptian funerary customs and hieroglyphics, Mr. Roberts appealed to the young people of the church to postpone reaching final convictions. To the church in general, he addressed a plea for a bar of conclusions. So don't come to a conclusion yet on the grounds that it was obviously impossible to answer the assertions of the scholars offhand. So it was too quick, I guess. The one thing Mr. Roberts felt confident, confident enough to do was to point out such discrepancies as the fact that one scholar called the hawk in the beer scene the hawk of Horus, while another called it Isis. Another said it ought to have a human head, and still another said it stood for the soul. At the Metropolitan Museum, examples are shown of where the hawk stood for all these things. The legend was that Isis took the form of a hawk to escape the enemies of Osiris, her husband, and that as a hawk she became the mother of Horus. Thus the hawk, when used to represent the soul, came to be known as the hawk of Horus, and as the Ba bird, or the soul bird, was represented in papyri as human-headed. And above you can see a picture of the Ba bird, or the soul bird, and it does have a human head. Okay, here we have the facsimile of the Mormon church where Abraham is supposedly being sacrificed. But what I liked about this one is that it was in color. So that's kind of cool, something different. So I thank you for watching this video.